Hello and welcome to Ukraine Today. I'm Vladimir Salub and I'm joined by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, Mr. Karl Belt. Mr. Belt, welcome to Ukraine Today. Thanks very much. Mr. Belt, uh, you were the Foreign Minister of Sweden during Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. Uh, do you think that in that time the EU should have done more to stop this and consequently the, the war which Russia started in eastern Ukraine, which already claimed 8,000 lives according to the UN estimates? I think it was very difficult uh, because at the time, obviously, the Ukrainian armed forces were in a mess for X numbers of reasons. So there wasn't very much resistance on Crimea itself. And accordingly, what you could do by sort of a global diplomatic means was extremely limited. Uh, Russia had uh, clear military superiority in that technical situation. But what about diplomatic uh, means? What about diplomatic pressure, international pressure? Could there, was there a window of opportunity to do something more to stop this whole mess? I think quite a lot was done, as a matter of fact. I mean, if, if you look at the international reaction at that time, it was uh, very strong, uh, including the General Assembly of the United Nations, because what happened with Crimea was such a flagrant violation of international law. Then when operation moved on to Donbass, Russians muddled the water somewhat, but the Crimea started with the Green Men's and they didn't really want to say what they were, but with the March 18 speech and the annexation, the violation of international law was so clear-cut that there was a very strong reaction. Mr. Bill, the war in East Ukraine has been lasting for more than a year now, and uh, some experts refer to it as hybrid war, some call the conflict, the crisis. Um, and also recently, there were some reports that Russia is trying to do something similar to, to stir up the hybrid war in Syria. So do you think the West, in general, is losing this hybrid war to Russia? I don't think so. Uh, if you look at, I mean, go back to uh, uh, when you can say the Donbass or the Novorossi operation was started, say, in mid-April of last year. I'm fairly certain that the expectations among those who took the decision for it was that they were going to sort of create a novel Russia, roll that out all the way to Odessa in three, four months or something like that. That did not happen. It failed. And they are now stuck with a minor portion of Donetsk and Luhansk and are essentially stalemate where they think they've also lost the military ability to move any further. So I think they're not that successful. They got stuck. And remains to see what is the continuation of it. So what is now happening in Syria? Do you think Russia is trying to maneuver its way out, start something different, divert attention? What is happening there? Difficult to know. Difficult to know. But it's fairly obvious that they have now somewhat stepped up their military support to Assad. It's been there all the time, by the way. We saw quite a lot of that whenever that could have been two years ago. Then it went down for a while and now it's been going up. And there are signs of them doing, preparing something more substantial. I still don't think that they will go fighting in Syria. Uh, but you never know. But it might be that they are putting a card there in order to say that we are an actor, we are a player in the Middle East, we want to be part of that particular game. In light of all the events which are happening in Ukraine, which are happening in the Middle East, do you think Russia has become a new security threat? To, to Europe, to the European continent? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you start violating the borders, uh, internationally recognized borders, and start to conduct aggression against independent countries, uh, then you are viol violating the very fundamentals of the order of peace and security in Europe. They are a threat, no question. Just a few months ago, um, there was quite a big uh, diplomatic confrontation between Russia and Sweden when there were reports that Sweden is considering thinking about joining NATO and then the Russian ambassador to, to Sweden said that should this happen, there will be military consequences. Um, how much of, 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 of true is that in, in, in this threat? And is Sweden seriously considering joining NATO? Well, we have a debate about that, and opinions are divided. It's, it's a big issue. I think debate has gone on quite some time. It's moving slowly in that direction, but it's going to be slow. But I think we, irrespective of, of what opinion you are on that particular issue, and the government is, to put it mildly, rather hesitant, uh, even the government has said this is not for Russia to interfere in. It is a sovereign decision of Sweden to decide whether we are going to do that or whether we could go do that. 
and the Russian ambassador have been told in no uncertain terms that uh, he should deal with other things. Well, obviously they're trying to intimidate you, and um, I think it was last year when there were these cases, almost um, uh, Cold War stories with submarines uh, submerging near near Stockholm. But all of these things that they are doing, sort of statements and things like that, is uh, at the end of the day counterproductive. Uh, it moves public opinion in the opposite direction. People don't like to be sort of uh, threatened or dictated or or lectured at by, uh, by the Kremlin. Uh, that applies not only to Sweden, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Talking about the public opinion, um, a lot of people are uh, on the, of, of the opinion that Russia is winning the information war in the West. And uh, just recently, the, the, the UN and the NATO have just started um, c taking countermeasures counter to counter Russian propaganda. Uh, how important is this information war and is the West indeed losing it? I don't think we are losing it, but uh, we should have been doing it better. And now I hope that uh, what is now being done will improve it. Uh, we've been sometimes too diplomatic. Uh, the Russians are sometimes fairly outrageous in what they are saying. And we've not been, <laughs> we've not been answering them in equal ways. That we must start doing. But I don't think they are winning, really. If you look at the opinion polls about what, what people think about Russia uh, throughout the world and throughout Europe, uh, you see that the image of Russia has deteriorated very, very substantially. Uh, take a critical country like Germany, and uh, you clearly have a significant change of public opinion in a negative direction. So we've not been as good as we should have been on this, uh, but Russia is certainly not winning. Talking to you as the international diplomats, uh, do you think that this crisis in, in Ukraine, uh, which started uh, with the legal annexation of Crimea and with Russia violating international law on each and every step and frankly uh, going away with it, do you think that this somehow undermines the international um, diplomatic system with UN Security Council being at its core? Well, it does if we don't react, and that is why we are reacting. Uh, the fairly strong sanctions and other actions that are in place is a clear sign not only to Russia but to other countries all over the world that you should not violate these fundamental rules, the territorial integrity, the sanctity of the borders. And, and over time, I think it will work, over time. Well, it doesn't look like it's working right now because uh, the, obviously the, the, the sanctions, as harsh as they are, they aren't stopping Russia. No. Uh, sanctions by definition works only in a fairly longer time direction, in longer time perspective, and only in sort of as part of an overall policy. Uh, I don't think we should sort of expect uh, Russia to fold the tent on Crimea and just go home and say, sorry, we did a mistake. That's not going to happen within the foreseeable future. But over time, there have been other examples throughout history where we've stuck to the guns. I mean, the United States, to take one example, never recognized the incorporation of the Baltic Republics in the Soviet Union. That took quite some time until that changed, but it did change. Do you think Ukraine has this time to wait? Because the fighting in the eastern Ukraine doesn't, no, it doesn't necessarily stop. I think eastern Ukraine is a different issue. I think there the Russian position is more difficult uh, to sustain. I think they will have difficulties with it over time. And at some point in time, not necessarily next week, I wouldn't be surprised if we see them sort of uh, starting to contemplate a discrete exit option. Uh, that's going to take some time and it requires unity in Ukraine and unity of the West. But again, talking about the time, can Ukraine, does Ukraine have this time at its hands? It's, it's in deep economic crisis and again, the fighting doesn't stop. No, the fighting has, no, the fighting has stopped. Uh, as a matter of fact, we do have a functioning ceasefire at the moment. Uh, and I think that is very important. I hope that lasts. And I think there are a couple of factors that leads me to be cautiously optimistic that it will stop. That's important for what's going on in Ukraine, which I think is absolutely critical. The democratic European reforms, agreements with the European Union, all of that, sorting out the, European, the, the Ukraine economy, that's going to take some time. But if that succeeds, Ukraine is going to be a far stronger and far more stable country than it has ever been. And as well, uh, let's see how things develop. Mr. Carl Bildt, many thanks for coming to us and ta uh, talking to us. This was Volodymyr Zelov for Ukraine Today, together with former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, Mr. Carl Bildt. Thank you for watching us.